So I guess it's my turn now. <laughs> You're laughing here. <laughs> it's not easy to be here in front. Like, uh, it's a bit nerving. <laughs> what to do? I got to do what I have to do. So. It's interesting to be a sort of like growing up a young monk and suddenly you're in a middle monk and you have to give this talk. So I, I'm, I, I'm not saying I, I really enjoy these things. Like I just look at my hands and I have my hands up with shaggy and I don't know what to do. So I'm thinking it's like, oh, what? No. There was a, one other monk of ours, uh, his friend of mine, when it was on 2D and he's, uh, he just had to give a talk and his mom was giving it advice that you just look at the audience and think they're all potatoes. But. <laughs> I, was, I thought about that advice. I don't think it's very great advice, but so I was like thinking of myself, what should I do? Well, like, how can I perceive you guys too? Because for us monks, it's so difficult to, because we, we are trained in sort of this way of like, we have a sense of restrainment and you meditate a lot of hours. I just finished my range retreat a couple of weeks ago and for three months, you're just like, you're just used to just like looking down, you just gaze down and you're not looking people too much. So it's for, it's, bit difficult for us monks sometimes we just sort of suddenly open up and you know talking to everybody so I'm, I'm I was thinking just there like what should I do so instead of thinking of you all as a potato so I'm just like I'm gonna perceive you as all as like little puppies <laughs> so like, okay so yes yes this seems to be working slowly my perception is changing so hmm yes Okay, now it's a lot easier. So I can see a lot of little dogs here in the, in the hall. I just went to the walk, just, uh, I just got back and, and I saw these little dogs there and everybody's so happy in seeing cats and dogs and it's so easy to go and pet them and you know, look at them in the eyes and say, how are you, and you know, talk to them. But somehow it's difficult for us to, you know, to have this talk to, the, as, as to, to an audience. So I'll see what, what, I, what can I do with this talking to you, dogs. So, the one thing is, uh, uh, my teacher Ajahn Pram told me one time, I said, you know, how should we give this talk? Because he's, he's a brilliant talker. And he says, the only, the only advice he gave me is just like, if you have, if you only, just, you, if you have something inspiring to say, then say something. So, that's another thing. It's like, I'm thinking when I was just, well, out there, it's like, maybe I'm not going to say anything, so I'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> I have anything inspired to say this morning. But so I guess I should talk about inspiration then. And that's what keeps me going as a monk, and I think it's a, it's a brilliant thing, so this inspiration. Sometimes it's a lot of perspiration as a monk. You, you're just sitting there and, you know, you, you just sit, 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 and there is no inspiration coming from anywhere. And... This is what inspires us monks. We're seeing your lay people, and it's this, we have this sangha with, you know, we have monks and nuns, and then we have the lay women and lay, lay men supporting us monks. And this is what brings this kind of joy to the monks, and hopefully brings joy to the lay people as well. Sometimes I know, I've, 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 I've seen sometimes lay people and monks start giving talks, and people start reaching to their mobile phones straight away, and it's like you sort of drift out straight away. And I think it's quite normal. I mean, we just, our brains are wired that way. And so that's why, uh, as monks, we try to tell stories. Because when you tell a story to people, you know, that everybody just perks up straight away. So that's a tip for you. If you have a, ever have to give a, a presentation at your workplace, just say, oh, I have this story to tell. You know, instead of going, the sales figures are this and that. No, you, you, you know, wrap it up in a, in a nice story. So I think that the same way the Buddha tells stories. And that's why it was for him to inspire people. And these things, they go deeper when you, um, when you tell stories. you sort of like you have this picture in your mind instead of having, okay, it's a, you know, going with the eight noble truths, uh, the, the, the four noble truths and the eightfold path and this and that. So sometimes we, we tend to be a bit dry sometimes in this uh, Ter Theravada tradition where uh, the Tibetans have all the bells and whistles. So and the Mahayanas, they've been more flamboyant as well. So, inspiration. Ah, I'm still nervous, so my hands are shaking. So. Usually people don't want to show it, so I want to show it today. So I'm, I'm really, I'm nervous. Um, so, inspiration. Um, uh, just recently, I was just in, uh, in the monastery in uh, Newbury, 
Uh, somebody asked me, how can I get these, my children to be, get in, interested in, in Dhamma? And I sort of thought about it. Sometimes I think there's a tendency of uh, parents to push their children towards uh, Buddhism or, you know, they, they should gain, you know, they should learn Dhamma and this and that and know how to recite chants and this and that. And I think sometimes it might be um, counterproductive to try to do that for your children. I think for us to learn confidence in Dhamma, it has to come from inspiration, and that's what the Buddha says as well. And when first you, you know, you gain uh, confidence and inspiration sort of come hand in hand, and that's, that's what, you know, comes in the suttas. Uh, and once you became, uh, become inspired of Dhamma, how, it, you know, it can help your life, how it, you know, brings value to your life, how you, you know, and because of that you feel confident that it works. But it actually, it's sort of, the, those things go hand in hand. They actually say the confidence comes first and then you get inspired. But with the inspiration, because of that, the Buddha said you become raptures, which sounds like reptilian thing, but because English is not my first language, so for me it's a funny word, raptures. But so your heart, your mind becomes really happy. You feel really happy about you know about the Dhamma, and you're gonna you know you you're so glad you came across this beautiful teachings, and because of that, your mind becomes peaceful, and that's the way it, uh, you become. Uh, you can um, start meditating a lot easier. So people, you know, it's quite common that people ask, like, how do I, you know, I can't meditate, my mind cannot be still, you know, at, at, you know, one second. And it's because you're not feeling happy inside. You don't have this kind of, uh, you don't have the confidence it's going to work. And then you, because of that, you don't have, you're not inspired to do that. You think you're just going sit to sit down and, you know, just tough it out. And that's... For, I can say for myself, I do it a lot of times as well. But because of these events, when I see we, we see monks, we see you guys, and I reflect on it. I reflect on these robes where you know the person who gave these to me, and I, I because of that I have to take care of it. I I, I reflect on the teachings of who I've been taught by in my teachers uh, in various places, and because of that I I feel I have to protect it, and I feel natural happiness because of that. And because I do this reflection, it's, it's quite an automatic process, but because you, um, because I live this lifestyle, that's why it's such a great lifestyle, because it's so inspiring for us monks to live this lifestyle. It really is. And that's why we are monks and nuns. And again, you know, last year I gave this talk here, where people asked why you become a monk. And I said, I really don't have a choice for it. I really felt that I, this, something drew me into this path. There's no, I mean, the, you know, we all know, we, if we, you know, we read our suttas and we know Buddhist teachings, there is no self there anyways. So what draws us into this, into this life uh, or in, you know, in Dhamma? And for me to come across this, I feel incredibly sort of blessed would be the word, which is, I don't know if it's a good word, but, um, I really appreciate what I came, came across. Because suddenly I found this thing and I said, this sounds right. This seems to be, you know, all of these teachings make so much sense. That's why I love it. It's, imagine, like, okay, going back to the, I'm not very, you know, maybe cohesive with these things, but imagine, like, the questions like, why, how can we get our children involved with Buddhism or Dhamma? It's, you, you cannot push them into that. You have to live, you know, your life and according to the, your values. And then hopefully they see that you are doing something right and they get interested on it. That's the, that's the biggest influence you can give them. Not by saying them, you know, they, they have to do this and they have to go on this. Sure, it's good to bring them into those places like, you know, uh, Buddhist society here, so they feel confident coming here, or bring them to the monastery, so they get the habit of giving to the monastery and monks and nuns. But for them to uh, really gain confidence into this, they have to be inspired. 
And same for you. Why would you come across Dhamma in this lifetime unless you're not inspired in this? Unless you, if you are, let's say, we, we call this Vesak Buddhist, you are a person who goes to temple once a year and you just do it because it's a custom. Do you think it's going to drive you in next lifetime into being a you know, Buddhist again to hear the Dhamma? No, you don't. There's no, you just did doing rituals. What's the point of that? Why, why would your habits, which take you from life to life, why would your habits then suddenly take you again into doing these kind of rituals which you thought of were meaningless to begin with? And why would something like, for me to coming from where I come from, really, uh, where there's no Dhamma, and then when hearing it, I get, you know, I, I feel inspired hearing it, and I feel gladness arising in me. Why would I do that then? Wh why would that come across in me, even though... So, you need to gain inspiration for the Dhamma. So, how to do that? You know, like, okay, so we do these things like you... You give, but not just to, you know, you don't have to give the monks and nuns. That's just, you know, how we usually talk that, you know, normally the, in the suttas say you give to the monks and nuns. But the Buddha also said, you know, give where your heart feels inclined to. And so that would be the dana part. So that's very, very uh, normal Buddhist teachings. Uh, another thing is like to gain uh, inspire, inspiration is to actually... You're already here. I mean, you're like already like so far ahead of a lot of people because you come and appreciate these monks and nuns who give these talks here. You, you, because of this, you get inspired. So just keep up with the habit. That's a great habit. I mean, sometimes you there's a lot of uh, inspiration. You might not be, you might get a bit bored listening to them, and but you just have to sort of endure with it sometimes and things sink in and the long, longer you are in this bus the further you're going to go that's the only thing you have to really worry about not to not to gain uh, not to get too um, bored is not the right word but it's not to uh, sort of just drop out with it say you know like I don't I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't know why I'm meditating. It's not going anywhere. That's the, that's the worst thing you can do with meditation is to stop doing it. And that's the, that's the only mistake you can make in meditation. Like Ajahn Brahm always says, his first teacher was saying that uh, there is no good or bad meditations. But th that's it. I mean, that's the, that's the bottom line of it. The, and the, the only thing you can make a mistake, what I'm saying, is stop meditating. Because of that, because, because you do the meditation, you do the reflection, you, it's automatic process. So you just, like, sometimes, okay, the inspiration, it gets you going somewhere, but sometimes you have to endure a little bit and then keep at it. So it's a nice cycle. And it, I can see for myself, it's changed me enormously, being in the monastery the last seven years. It's amazing. So I, I, I really, you know, value these things. The, these things. Um, what else? So I, I hear we're live streaming, so we probably have two people watching this. <laughs> How many? Five? Got ten. ten. Well, that's pretty good. I had ten people. Uh, I last year I I gave a talk and I, it was I, I was pretty happy about it and <laughs> I, I looked I just recently looked last week and it was like four thousand people watching it, so I was pretty good. I think my mom watched it, you know, two thousand times <laughs> with her friends, so. You know, you, it doesn't matter who, who's watching it. So I, I think it, it was, it's an amazing thing. But then, you know, I was inspired by 4,000 people. And then uh, it's interesting. I, I had to change some uh, tools in the monastery. And I, I, so I looked this YouTube video and I looked this person doing this, you know, changing the tool on the tractor. And they, they had 92,000 people had watched them changing the tool on the tractor. So my 4,000 people wasn't that great. But <laughs> good enough. I, see how, you know, there's only so few people. There's a lot of people have dust in their eyes. And, you know, we're the minority, so we should be happy about it. So um, Now there's 11 people. <laughs> Hello, 11 people. Nice to see you. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a great thing. It's, it's, it's amazing that we have this YouTube and uh, new technologies. So it's great that, you know, we spread the teaching a bit further than just this hall, but because a, a lot of people can't come here. And it, that's how I found this 
thing, you know, that's the only reason. Maybe I could have come across of it, you know, it would have taken a bit longer, but I, I, I found Ajahn Brahm because of the YouTube videos. So, um, inspiration. Um, uh, okay, think, think fast. Um, my mind just went blank. Um, these are the like worst things when you when you're giving a talk. The mind doesn't just doesn't serve a purpose. Okay, so I have to just talk from my heart then. So um, I remember when I was a kid, and the the worst the best thing for me was just to go and see my grandmother. And I never wanted to leave there. And for me to go to her house and uh, stay with her was just su such a like sort of this kind of uh, this kind of nice holiday and even this at this age, time and age you know I'm al almost 40 now I have these kind of memories of these beautiful childhood memories where everything was sort of sun it was shining and you know grandma was there and we just had all this time for ourselves and for me the, one of the interesting things was just there was just my grandma was living in this farm. It's really, it's a you know, remote part of Finland. It's really remote farm. So there's nothing there. It's absolutely nothing there. And it was just there with my brother all summer. And when I was there, after a couple of weeks, it starts to get a bit boring. There's nothing happening. Grandma goes into the, you know, milk the cows every morning. Then she has to do the chores. She doesn't have a lot of time for us. She, she can't just play with us. She was there by herself. My grandfather died a long, long time, so I never got to know him. So my grandma was, you know, running this farm by herself. There was just, we had like three cows, outhouse. There was no running water into the house. So it was really, there was, like now I think it's idyllic, but then I thought it was a mm, third world country place. I didn't, we, you know, she had a horse. She never had a tractor. So this is the sort of the background I come from, you know, like horse and buggies. And it's amazing why, you know, I ended up moving to New York and working for Google. And it was like, you know, my life really changed from my childhood. So anyways, I, 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 but I still really love to stay there. I mean, she's a, she was a wonderful grandmother. She was like um, one of those really, you know, beautiful grandmothers we have loving memories of. And I remember quite often in the morning she went to milk the cows and feed the sheep and this and that. And quite often I was just laying in the bed. Just I, I woke up when she had to go in the morning. So, but I, I knew I, have, I didn't have anywhere to go. I have nothing to do in the mornings. So I was just lying there on the bed and just doing nothing. And I was, let's say I was four years old, five years old. I spent those summers there. And I was just lying in the bed and in early mornings, and because I was, I knew I didn't have to do anything. I have nowhere to go. I have nothing to do. My mind started to become peaceful by itself. Not that I was doing anything. My mind was sort of, because it was just so content of not going anywhere. It, ha it has this habit of becoming peaceful by itself. So even now, these days, I meditate, and when I, my mind starts going deeper, I always remember those exactly same feelings I get. There's this amazing, even bodily feelings I get, the same kind of bodily feelings I get when I got those days. And same kind of mind. I remember, like, oh, I've been here before. It's amazing feeling. It's like, it's, you almost, like, taste it. It's, you, you can smell it. It feels... It feels comfortable. It feels like I've been here before. And I think there's a lot of things we, we have these experiences as, as child, a lot of us, where we had contentment and joy, and there's nothing to do, nowhere to go, but we forget them in our busy lives. And people say, you know, meditation is difficult, but it's not. As a four-year-old, I could do that. As a four-year-old, I got actually quite often I got deeper meditation than 
I didn't know it was meditation, but it might have been a habit from my previous life. I, I, I don't know. Really, I cannot claim anything, or I wouldn't even, even if I could, I, I could not as a monk say anything like that. But my mind went deeper meditation than what it, I, can, I can get now, sometimes. It's just, it, it was so automatic. It was, I didn't do anything. That's the thing about meditation. People, what should I do, you know, should I watch the breath, or do this or that? No, you don't. You just have to, imagine what it is for a child to meditate. What, what is a four-year-old four year going to do? It's not going to do anything. It was just content being there and lying down underneath the blanket after, you know, just waking up early in the morning and just lying there underneath the blanket and just feel like there's nothing to do, nowhere to go. And that's the meditation. And because of those things, I also gain inspiration because of that. Because I feel that I was in a place where, where nothing mattered. And I think sometimes we think we put value in things which don't have value and don't value things which we should value. And that's the thing also the Buddha said, you know, the unenlightened people think highly, regard highly of things which don't need to be highly regarded. Imagine if you live your life and you were really successful, and, but because of that you had to be really busy in your life. And it's very common, especially amongst us men. And if you reflect that way and you see, you know, I ended up here and you, you feel happiness because of that, but then at the mom moment of you're going to die, how happy are you actually going to feel about it, all of those successes, because you have to leave them behind. So the success, instead of driving you towards good mind state when you, you know, you're driving, it almost drags you down to the other, uh, other opposite, of the, the, into the sort of like you feel remorseful and you feel you waste a lot of time. And so that would really not bring you to happy rebirth, to a happy place. But if you feel that you've done your duties as good as you can and you, as you feel that you, you know, you were good enough with your family. I mean, of course, not, we cannot be the, you know, like the saints in our family. I mean, families tend to be like that. But if you are, you know, a forgiving person, if you're a giving person, if you are, try to be kind. And that's my goal, actually, in this lifetime. I don't want to be the, the best chanter or best uh, scholastic monk in this lifetime. Maybe I could have the skill if I would put all the effort, but I don't want to. I don't really don't want to put all this effort, what I have, to learning all these things. For me, it's good enough to know the basic teachings of the Buddha and be as kind person as I can be. And it rejoices when other people are bringing me stuff, and that brings me happiness, and that keeps me going in monastic life. There are a lot of other monks who bring a lot of value in, in, into this uh, into this path by doing translations and this and that. It's not my thing. My thing, what I'm trying to do is trying to be as forgiving and kind person as I can. And I'm not there yet. I'm not saying, you know, monks who live with me, they know sometimes I have my crumpy days, I get up out of the bed, you know, with the wrong foot and I start snapping off. But at least I know inside of me that's the wrong path. The Buddha said if you're an angry person, you are like a mad person. And so quite often uh, people ask me, it's like, oh, I'm, like, I'm an angry person, or I get really easy angry, what should I do about it? Well, you can think of you crazy if you do that. That should take you snap out of it a little bit. Do you, do you want to be a crazy person or you want to be, you know, normal, sane? But also one thing, is that Dhammapada, I think, is a nice verse of, of uh, Buddha saying that um, anger, is ne uh, anger is never subdued by anger. By love alone, anger is subdued. And if you think about it, it makes sense. You cannot fight anger with anger. You cannot get angry of your anger because that's not going to do anything for it. 
you have to embrace it. You have to love your, all those things you have. If you have anger inside of you, you have to let it come. You have to sort of, you have to <laughs> embrace it. And that's what, I, it's probably a lot of people heard the Ajahn Brahm's anger eating demon story. Have you heard it? Uh, okay, enough not, so I'm not going to tell the story. <laughs> Otherwise people are bored. I, I, I tell the, the gist of it. It's the, it's the anger, anger eating demon coming into the palace and he starts, people are saying, you know, you don't belong here. And people start getting more, you know, it grows a little bit bigger. And, you know, the more people push it away, these, all these people out of the palace, they're trying to push the anger eating demon out of the palace. And the more it grows bigger and gets spikier and smellier. And the same thing about your own anger, about your own past experiences. The more you try to push them away, the bigger and smellier they're going to grow. And that's the, that's, the, that's the story about the anger eating demon. The, the worst thing you can do about those things is to try to push them away. I shouldn't be an angry person. I'm a Buddhist, this and that. You know, you tell somebody off, you ask, uh, you, you ask forgiveness. You say, I'm sorry, you know, try to be honest about it. And that's what I try to do about it. There's a monk sitting next to me, and I, you know, I, I, I tell him often breakfast time, lunch time, I, two hours later, I say, I'm sorry, I did that. I, I went somewhere else and it cooled down, and I became a, you know, I get, got snapped out of my insanity, and I realized I have to ask for forgiveness. And that's another thing, how you can uh, uh, get, sort of not get rid of it, but subdue your anger. It's, it's the asking forgiveness and giving, for, you know, giving, um, giving forgiveness, is that a right word? I don't know. Yes, okay, good enough. You understand what I'm saying. Sorry. Um, but what's the worst thing to do if somebody asks you forgiveness? What's the worst thing you can do? You say, I'm sorry, but. Never do that, okay? Never say, I'm sorry, but. But, okay? If there's anything I can teach you today, remember that. Yeah. Don't say but. I forgive you, but. No. You say, uh, yes, I forgive you, or you say, that's okay, this and that. That's it. You, you end there. That, you know, tch. don't go any further than that. I actually learned this. Uh, I, I read about it. It was a, six months ago. I was reading New Yorker. And there was this article. I love New Yorker. They have these long articles, and they, they have uh, the power of forgiveness. And they actually did this psychology department in some big, you know, fancy university about uh, forgiveness. And they said it's so powerful to, you know, ask forgiveness. And, you know, if somebody asks you, you know, you forgive them. And really, it leaves an amazing, you know, your mind it just changes you. Even if you don't really mean it, you sort of crushingly do it. So like, I'm sorry. Uh, it still leaves relief. And amazing thing I noticed when I've, 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 I was mindful about it, not saying the but. And somebody asked me, you know, I'm sorry. And you don't really want to forgive them. But you say, yes, oh, that's okay. Or, you know, I forgive you. Which I always do these days. I just say, I forgive you. And I leave it there. Uh, so I've noticed what happens if you don't do that, but if you don't start telling you, but you shouldn't behave, you know, you, you should, you shouldn't do this and this, the bum bum bum. Your mind cannot go there anymore. It's like it's the end of the road. It's you, you made a deal. You forgave him. So I cannot go and tell him off anymore because they sort of you lost the situation. So it's oh man, it's like a win-win situation. Uh, and I, I remember telling this story. Oh, that was an in, embarrassing story. I don't know if I should tell this because I'm on live streaming and people cannot edit this out. But I had this, we had this great thing. We, we met these uh, Christian monks and nuns. We had this uh, event. And um, uh, I was telling this story. I was really inspired. I read this story just, you know, last week or something. And, and then we had the meeting and I was telling this, how's oh, it? The forgiveness is such a great thing because it was, I think it was the topic when we met the Christian monks and nuns. And I said, uh, it was like, I learned these things, don't say, ever say but. And then somebody, then somebody recently asked me forgiveness. I said, oh, I forgive you. 
uh, oh, sorry, it was other way around. They, they asked me, I asked them forgiveness, and they said, I forgive you, and then they said the but. And then I said, you know, Jesus, I've, that pisses me off. <laughs> and, and like five minutes later, one of the other monks from my monastery said, oh, great, well done, Mudito. You just uh, had a blasphemy, and uh, you cursed in a set one sentence. So that went well. <laughs> so, you know, once a Things to, you know, when you keep talking, you, you get in trouble. The more you talk, the more you get into trouble. Um, so, the, and later on, you know, a couple of minutes later, there was this one nun that said, oh, I remember, you, you're the angry one. I said, what? How, do you, how come I'm the angry one? I was like, I was, you know, yeah, so. Um, so forgiveness, that's also, it's, you know, inspires me. Because when I live with monks in my monastery, and there's some monks who are really good at it. And those are the one, really the monks I know I don't have to be afraid of. Or I can live really, at, I can be at ease with them. Because I know even if they, you know, they're angry, suddenly they get sort of like on bad mood or something. They come back to me half an hour later, you know, next day or something, you know, I'm sorry I did that. I'm sorry I wasn't in the right state of mind. And it's, it's, it's amazing to live with people like that. It's amazing. To, that's why we have monasteries, and the one thing we, we value in the monastery is harmony. That's the best thing you can have in the monastery, is harmony. And I think for, it would be the same for families, and, but you, maybe you don't reflect it enough. And because of the harmony, we enjoy what we're doing. And because of the harmony, we keep going year after year. And... It's, a, it's not really easy thing to do, be, being a monk. You, you've seen a lot of monks with this rope, in, even in this place. And bec it's, because it's a daily grind, uh, if, if, and it really easily becomes that. It really easily becomes for me as well. I wake up in the morning, I sit down, I just meditate, 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 then I go and have a little breakfast, and then I go back to my heart and meditate, 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 then I have a lunch, then I meditate, 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 meditate. Where do you get inspiration from that? I get it from these kind of events where it's just random act of kindness when people give me ropes, people feed me daily. I mean, this is the best job if you think about it. <laughs> people, you know, people bring me, I don't have to go shopping, I don't have to go driving, I don't have to, well, how good is this? But still you get bored of it because you, you just, you know, you go and do the same thing day after day and it, if, you, if, if I wouldn't reflect on it, if I wouldn't see the value on this, then I would have been gone, you know, a long time ago. But still, you know, seven years after on the path that I'm still here. And, and this, it's these little things also in the monastery, because just recently one of our senior monks said, uh, told me, uh, he's, he said, you know, he sees like he, like he feels like I'm his younger brother to him. And I was so... It's hard for me to explain it, but I felt like two weeks I wouldn't uh, touch the crown. I felt uh, like really happy. It was an amazing experience for me. Somebody saying, you know, like I feel like you're my family, suddenly. And I, I feel, and because of that I feel really, even, again, if, so, if that monk would now get angry at me, or, you know, tell me off, some, you know, something, it happens really rarely, I'm, I'm just mentioning, but if it would happen. I would just like, it doesn't matter, we're family. In a family, the good thing about families, we always have little, you know, squabbles and this and that, but we know, we come back next day and we're like, oh, let's just forget about it, you know. That's the amazing thing when you, when you, you, you can be at ease with somebody. And that's why you should be this kind of person, which also I'm aspiring, I might not be the best, but I'm going towards it. I try to be easy person to admonish and, you know, and always asking forgiveness and try to be malleable person. And people think, you know, people are going to start abusing you, this and that. No, no, it's not going to happen. Don't worry about it. If you are easygoing person, a malleable person, people want to hang out with you and people respect you. That's the nature of it. You can, you might not believe it, but you can just try it. And you, if you think it's gonna, you're gonna be this kind of uh, floor mat for everybody. Sure, sometimes you have to have 
you know, boundaries and this and that, but m less and less is better. The, the less of boundaries you have, the more flexible you can be, the more forgiving and kind person you can be, the better it is. And it can be done. I mean, of course, it's easy for me because I'm a monk and people sort of... I, I, I see you, all of you. I guess maybe the puppies are now sort of fading away, but I can see my family here now. So I don't have a family. I haven't, met, I haven't seen my family for two years, but you are my family. And my mom asks all the time when I call him once a week, how are you doing? I hope, you know, are you taking care of yourself? Yeah, I'm taking care of myself, but there's a lot of other people who are taking care of me as well. I have this big family of you guys here. And because you're my family, you take care of me, right? <coughs> right. You feel obligated because I, I, I rely on you. I, I value what you do because you come and, you know, help me. And same goes for these kind of places, like Buddhist Society of Victoria. I, I love this place. I love you. Uh, uh, that we have this kind of place, it's, really, it's so rare. I mean, Sydney, they don't have anything like this. Perth, we have an amazing place because of the efforts of the monks and mostly Ajahn Brahm. But in here, same thing. We, please value this place. We, we need to pay our electricity bills. <laughs> this is the paid commercial. <laughs> we need to pay the internet bill so people can be so you can listen to it online but that's the thing you know so it's a great that you come and you know support us these places and it's great that you appreciate us the, you know and you great that you appreciate the dhamma that's where it boils down to the buddha was a he was a you know normal person but he had amazing teachings he saw this game what you guys are playing and if you would see the game as well I don't think you would want to play. So think what you're doing. Get inspired. Be, ins yeah, be inspired. Be forgive, uh, forgive, and you know, forgive other people. Um, I think I should be talking ten more minutes, but I don't have anything really else to say. I think I'm blanking out more and more. So, uh, please ask me questions. Uh, okay. When you think of a human being, I mean, unlike human animals, we are so much uh, interdependent. Uh, no human being can live without the uh, help of another human being. Mm -hmm. We don't grow the food. Somebody has grown the food for us. We can't make these clothes. Mm -hmm. We can't make these spectacles. But somebody has done. It's true, we give money and buy it. So we cannot live like what we live as human beings if not for the help of other human beings. Hmm. If you really truly understand that, you really developed universal loving kindness. Hmm. There's no problem, you see. Mm -hmm. You can't just exist without other human beings. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thing. I was like, uh, one time, Bhante Suchada was living in our monastery. He's now in Taiwan. If, I don't know if people know him, but he's a translator. And um, he's now, he, he sort of surrounded himself in this lonely island just so he can translate the whole Nikaya again. Um, and I, he's always, he has this habit of when he gives a talk, if he thinks of something, he cannot talk about it. So he comes to the stage and he starts asking people like, oh, what should I talk? So there's a topic which has, he hasn't thought about. And I ask him, can you talk about artificial intelligence? Because he's, um, he's actually really interested in that kind of stuff. And he said, you know, and it was, a, it was a good talk, but one thing which I remember from that talk, he was said, if it was a truly artificial intelligence, the only thing, conclusion it would come is to, uh, to have gratitude, to have compassion. That would be really, truly intelligent, you know, being. If it was really highly super intelligent, it almost would shut itself down. It was like... I have so much compassion for all these people, so that would be the, the highest conclusion artificial intelligence could come. I don't, I'm just like, yeah, that makes sense. But that's been maybe in the long run, but exactly right. You know, we, ha we have to have, in, you know, it depend on other people. Um, any other questions? About five minutes? Yes, please. Just on forgiveness, some really important people to me have passed away recently mm -hmm. and um, it causes reflection on my behaviour and at times I'm 
like to seek their forgiveness, and I guess the way that's gotten to me is seeking my own forgiveness. Mm. But when I go to grant it to myself, inevitably there's always a but at the end, and I'm back to square one. Uh-huh. So this self-forgiveness <coughs> is proving elusive. Mm-hmm. It's elusive, yeah. yeah. Well, what can he do? Just keep at it. Um, a lot of things we think is elusive. A lot of things like the meditation, you're not going anywhere. And we, uh, okay, fair enough. We're not even trying to go anywhere. But with the, with the forgiveness, you have to try it from different angles. And you, you keep trying, 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 trying. And some, some, you know, someday you just, you get better, better at it. And at you know, some point you get to find an angle which works for you. It's not like I can tell you this is how it works. I, I can, the only thing we can sort of inspire to, to do is to try it to keep at it. It's like the meditation. Keep at it and try different things. This works for you and, you know, and something else works for me and you know what I'm saying. You know, it's a good thing to do. I mean, if it, ma- if it does make sense, doesn't it, that, you know, at least you try and you, you, you have this past, you know, luggage with you. One day you just say, I don't need to carry this with me. It takes time, I know, but we, that's the only thing. Otherwise, you, you drag it all along to the grave and you take it, you package with you and you take it to the next lifetime. You don't want to do that. Less, less luggage you have when you're, going down, when you're going six feet under, it's the better it is, I'm telling you. Don't take big pockets with you and stuff money in there and you know, take your you know, memories with you in as well. Le- at least, you know, you, we tend to, you know, carry them around, but less we, less we carry it around, the better it is. The lighter you feel. And I've, I, there's inspiring stories about people who suddenly just sort of like, I don't need to do that, this thing anymore. And I don't need to be, you, you don't need to hurt yourself. Why would you hurt yourself? Why would you suddenly, if you just realize, oh, I'm doing this because, and, and it hurts me, then it's like, why am I doing this again? That's, you, you, need to see, need, you need to see the value in it. That's, you know, that if you don't do it, you hurt yourself more and more. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, please. It's good that people ask questions. Buddha's, Buddha said, you know, like, why are people beautiful in this lifetime? And, you know, somebody asked, why are people li- beautiful in this lifetime? And Buddha said, because they had metta in their previous lifetime. And then said, they asked, like, why are people smart in this lifetime? And Buddha said, because they asked questions in their previous lifetime. So everybody who's asking questions is going to be born as an Einstein. Yes. Hi. Um, sometimes you don't meet people's expectations and they get angry at you. Yeah. And I'm talking, reflecting on personal experience. And you ask, you apologise, you know, that you haven't met their expectations, but they can't, because they believe you haven't met them, they're angry at you, so you, they can't even accept that. So how, do you, how would you approach that in, in terms of forgiveness? and mm. That you haven't fulfilled their expectations. Well, I mean, you just have to. You're not going to change the world. You're not going to change other people. You can't even change your children. You cannot change your... Definitely not my mom. I'm not going to even try. That's, you know, like, that's, I know it's so beyond me. But the only, only person you can change is yourself. And you, the only th- person you can just like, I'm not going to, those people are trying to push your buttons. And you, you just don't like, no, that's it. I have enough loving kindness for, for myself. I've forgiven myself that, you know, these things, that I'm not the best person. And I have enough gratitude for myself that I'm not going to act upon those things anymore. And so much stuff we do in this lifetime, which we think people don't have enough gratitude for us or don't, don't, we don't fulfill the expectations, but they, just, they would be just happy with us anyways. But we think it's not. So, don't, you know, reflect more that way. Try to see it's like it's coming from your, more from yourself actually probably than from the others. You are your own, own enemy, your worst enemy, which is really, really is true so many times. I mean, you guys don't mind, if, you know, like a me giving a talk, even if it's the, not the best talk. But for me, it was, it's, it's a nerve-wracking situation. You know, you probably don't mind me doing this, but for me, it's like it's, it's a difficult thing to do.
and it's not you. I'm putting that, you know, pressure on myself. Hmm. Oh, it's 10.30. Did I do it? <laughs> okay, if there's any more questions, is there? Okay. Uh, Bante, yes. are, yeah. are there any sort of techniques to mentally forgive people you think have treated you badly? Uh, loving kindness is always good. You know, try try that. It's really, really easy. And there's all, all the other ones uh, where you feel, you know, gratitude and this. But loving kindness, is, they say, it's the basic uh, basic thing. And I just asked recently from Marjan Pramali, my teacher uh, in Bodhinyana, I asked him, like, why do we always do metta? And why metta is so mentioned so many times in a, like what should we do instead of like mudita or you know uh, um, the other Brahma Viharas and Ajahn Pramali said that uh, metta is the one which is the inner you know, foundation you just have to keep at it you just have to keep practicing it and you might not feel it but um, in the beginning but the only way to succeed is uh, at it is to Keep at it. Keep trying to find the different angles into it. And it's the basic practice. That really is a basic practice in, in the Dhamma. And it's a really strange for me then hear these stories about Burma, what's happening with the monks, what they're teaching, this and that. It was like, did they get the basics from it? How can you, you know, go into genocide if you, and you say you're, you know, really a Buddhist person? I don't understand that. Yeah. Did you have a continue? Um, I... Yeah, I mean, just some people, it's really challenging. I find it really challenging. Oh, sure. Um, and, and I just wondered, is it better to try loving kindness or just sort of let it go for a while? Um, it depends on the situation. I mean, um, sometimes, you know, you, you need to love the tiger from the distance. Don't, don't go petting the tiger, you get hurt. Um, if, if you need to feel the feel that you need to keep the distance, then yeah. Sure, but and with the loving kindness, you know, have the little like I just went for the walk and I saw these cats and dogs over there, and it's so easy to you know love have loving kindness towards them, and it's so easy to you know have this kind of thing. So inspire yourself with those things which bring you happiness, and then and feel what it feels inside, and you know, and and reflect on it, and keep at it this way. You know, find your angle. What inspires you? What 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 takes your boxes in in a good way? Not you know the the. It's always easy to remember that you know like the the bad law things that p people push your buttons, but try to find the good buttons. Hmm. Very good. All right, so that's it. Bye bye for the people. Eleven people. Is it probably twelve now? For in internet, nice, nice uh, talking to you. Hopefully, I can get. Um, I'm trying to get a video going. Actually, I, I I love you know sort of this kind of video. So I'm trying to get a little thing happening from the Newbury Monastery, so uh, we can all see that you know what's the progress we've done there. Because I think it's sometimes a bit out of the way. You guys don't see what's happening. We're really working hard there, cleaning the things and weeding, and ton of things are happening there. I mean, but it, it's sort of. If you come there, well, then nothing really happened. And, you know, we're slugging our bumps off all week, cleaning the crown. So, and you, but so I'll try to do a little bit of video. It was, it's, it's a hilarious when you film yourself. It's, it's an absolutely crazy thing to do. But I, you know, I've tried to do that. So, I'll see you again maybe next year. This is my second talk here in the BSV, and it was l lovely to be here and nice to see everybody. All my family here. So, <laughs> I see you maybe next year again. Before then, okay. Sad, sad, sad.